we used to think of dizziness as a problem with the NAM, but research from 2020 from the University Hospital Wales found that it's not just a problem with sensory sensitivity from the ear, but all sensory systems. So today we're going to be discussing this research paper and, and how it affects people with TRIPD. So Ben, this is a really interesting paper, quite a dense one, where they took 29 people with TRIPD diagnosed at the hospital, and then they compared that to nearly 1,000 people in the general population without dizziness to see what the sensory sensitivities were. Now, the interesting thing about that paper is that they gave them a whole bunch of um, questionnaires, some to do with dizziness, so to see uh, like how dizzy they are in general. And then importantly, they gave them a bunch where the things to do with visual or vestibular sensitivity were deliberately taken out. So we know that people with triple PD are going to be more visually sensitive and they're also going to be more vestibular sensitive. So that means that if there's visual motion in front of them, they feel more, se more dizzy, they're more sensitive to that motion, but also when they're moving. So the classic one would be, you know, they might be on a boat. They're going to feel that movement of the boat far more than someone else without triple PD. So in this piece of research, they were looking at the general population saying, okay, compared to the general population, how sensitive are they to touch or taste or mm -hmm. smell or any other kind of uh, sensory system? So it's a really interesting paper, quite a dense one, quite a complicated one <laughs> in yes. terms of the statistics and stuff. Um, one of the key findings they, they found with it was that people with TRIPD were more sensitive across all different sensory systems that were tested. And I think that's probably something that we see all the time, Ben, isn't it? That people aren't visually sensitive or sensitive to motion. They also complain that they're they're in pain, that their neck hurts, that their back hurts, that they they can't tolerate the hot very well in the summer, but equally they hate the cold in the winter. Uh, have you found that as well, Ben? Yeah, completely. And it's quite interesting how many people then ask the question of like, is this my triple PD or is it something else? And I think prior to this paper, it was it was harder to attribute to triple PD. Yeah, absolutely. And also at hard because they just start, start to feel a bit broken, that they start to think they're being a bit fragile and pathetic of like, God, I just, you know, I, I used to be able to do all this amazing stuff, but now I can't go in the sea because it's too cold. And I, but also summer holidays are rubbish. I don't like, you know, I don't want to go anywhere hot. I don't want to go skiing. I don't want to do anything that has kind of out, I've got this, my range of stuff I can do has just shrunk down to this small little window. Um, it can also be more sense, you know, just stress sensitive. So a bad night's sleep has a disaster. Whereas, you know, you might be able to say, ideally we get that seven to nine hours, but you might say, if I get six hours, I should still be able to function the next day. Yeah. Whereas often you'll see in trip PD, people are like, man, I don't sleep well, but then also I can't get on with it the next day like I used to be able to. Oh, completely. And it's like you say, sometimes the goal for that individual might not even necessarily be as specific as I want to feel less dizzy, but actually it's almost more, it's, it's bigger. It's like, I just don't want to feel fragile anymore as often the word often gets thrown around or I want to feel more robust because yeah. like you say, it can be bigger for people than just being a bit dizzy. It's, it's everything they can no longer tolerate like they used to. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so hard, isn't it? When you've got that shadow of, of it's known if shadow is the right word, but you're comparing yourself to who you are really. And, and almost like you're the shadow, really. Like you got who you are really is this person who can work hard and look after the family and have lots of friends and socialize and do all this great stuff. And then you've just been forced, you know, being battered down by being so sensitive to all these things that actually it's just easier not to do any of these things and, and you just can't do them. I always feel particularly mm -hmm. sorry for, for parents who have young children because kids are loud. Like I've got two young kids. They are amazing, but they are just loud. And when you have that that increased sense of sensitivity, I have parents who say to me, like, I don't like my kids. It's all mm. to say, but I don't like my kids. I don't can't be in the room with them. They're yeah. so noisy. When they cry, I should be sympathetic and empathetic and want to hug them up. And instead I'm like, shh, just you know, enough. Enough. It's too much. And you gotta feel pretty awful as a parent when when that's happening, not just once, because we all have <laughs> we all have those days where we're like, Oh my god, I'm gonna kill my kids. But when it's every day, actually psychologically that can be pretty devastating. Gosh, yeah, that's a really, really good point, actually, because it, it can be bigger than just a case of an identity crisis where it's like, oh, I can't be that parent or that athlete or that person in that career anymore. It's a great point there, actually. It's like, I, I don't even feel like I can be a good version of that, the version I know I can. And I guess there's that, that sense of worry that it's it's like the people just think I'm just a really bad person now. And it's like, no, 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 not at all. Like, you're genuinely struggling and it's it's not it's not your fault. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. To be to be your best, right? You've got to be well rested, and um, you've got to feel good. And it's really easy to say, 
uh, that you should be emotionally available to your kids and and to your partner and to your friends and you should be engaging and present and but if you're not feeling good it's almost impossible I, I've always thought that with um you know I'm a big fan of mindfulness and meditation things like that but it's really easy to do those things and to be mindful when you're in a good place it's almost impossible is it, I don't, the example I might give you Ben I apologize so if you've heard me say this too many times but it's a bit like if you and me having this conversation that poison snake is in the room again you know I'm always getting that poison snake but if it's in the room right now I'm going to really struggle to to give my all to you yeah. when when that's over here now with uh dizziness any form of dizziness doesn't have to be triple pd any form of chronic dizziness uh if you take away car crashes motorbike accidents the leading cause of accidental death and injury worldwide is falls and it has always been the uh falls just falling over is responsible for 20 to 30 percent of all mild to severe in injuries worldwide that's a crazy statistic, isn't it? You think huge. all the ways you can get hurt, you know, you just <laughs> yeah. start writing them down all the ways, 20 to 30% is just tripping over, falling over, slipping yeah. over. So deep in our DNA is this fear of falling. And when we are scared, even if you can try to consciously kind of tell yourself, well, come on, it's okay. I'm not actually going to fall over. Deep in your DNA is this driving force saying anxiety is there to keep me safe. It's a good adaptation. And a part of that is increased sensory, um, 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 emotion perception from your eyes and your ears. But it seems like from this paper that actually it's saying all sensory systems get uh, more activated. I think the other interesting thing on that one, talking about like the fear and the anxieties, the other big takeaway that I quite liked from this paper was that although we know that anxiety does play a role with the sensitivity, um, and they were discussed the paper before and they were linking the anxiety even to the motion sickness, uh, preponderance motion sickness. But in this one, it was interesting they were saying that yes, anxiety does seem to, m might relate to the severity of the symptoms and might increase sensitivity. But when they then took the anxiety questions out and took the anxiety data away, even then there still, still seemed to be that sufferers of um, triple PD um, did also have a, a high preponderance, just greater sensitivity, this wide range of stimuli, irrespective of kind of what's going on anxiety wise, which sometimes can be reassuring to kind of go, yes, we can address the anxiety and that's important. But there is also something that's very separate. So people don't think it's either A or in their head or B. It's just all my no matter. Yeah, no, that's such a good point. I, I, I actually found that a bit of a surprising finding in the study. Because for so long, we've been like, oh, dizziness and anxiety. And you, at your, that point is perfect. They partial, It had a partial impact. So the anxiety had a partial impact on symptom severity. But it wasn't the biggest factor. The biggest factor was overall sensory sensitivity which is really interesting that kind of really re rewrites the playbook and almost makes it more insulting if you've had chronic dizziness and you're going to people and they're saying it's your anxiety and it's like partially partially <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so they found in the study what they did is they took all those different sensory sensitivities and sensory avoidance behaviors and they grouped them all together to have like this kind of global sensory sensitivity kind of scale and then compared What's that like in people with triple ED compared to the general population? Another really interesting thing they found was that in the general population, people who have self-reported they're not dizzy and they removed anyone that said they were. So they went through the general population, anyone who said they were dizzy, they took out of that study. So you're looking at people who should be the healthy controls. 10% of those healthy controls had uh, all the signs of, of triple PD, but didn't quite meet the full criteria. So when they compared it to the the twenty uh, to the twenty nine people with triple PD, the general population ten percent of those people had more dizziness or more sensory like visual motion sensitivity and vestibular sens sensitivity than the people with triple PD, which is a really interesting one. You're saying actually it, in this population anyway, ten percent of the people already have are almost like predisposed to dizziness. Now nothing has come along to push them into it yet, but maybe uh, an ear infection or a BPPV or uh, uh, giving birth or having a, a minor surgery or a short stay in hospital or a death in the family or whatever it could be, could be that thing that pushes you over the edge from, actually, I'm always just a bit sensory sensitive into, oh, I've started developing dizziness and now that dizziness is chronic. And I, that was another one that I've always, I've always felt that when people tell me the history, there's these little signs in the histories, like in their teens, they were always there was they weren't overtly dizzy, but they they didn't like motion, they didn't like being on boats, they didn't they hated um, 
uh, merry-go-rounds and all that kind of stuff. They hated swings. They wouldn't go climbing. They were, you know, a bit agoraphobic, wouldn't go out, didn't like big spaces. In their 20s, they had a couple of episodes of dizziness, but it was short-lived and it got better. And they get to their 30s or 40s or 50s and when life starts getting hard and then this chronic dizziness develops and kind of dominates the life. And you can think, I wonder if I'd met you 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Would I, if I did my assessment, would I have already found that you had that visual dominance, that vestibular sensitivity? Was it already right there? And this paper is definitely suggesting that, yeah, that, you know, in their population anyway, in that 10% of nearly 1,000 people, so you're talking about nearly 100 people who are saying, hey, I'm not dizzy, actually have the same sensory markers as someone with chronic dizziness. God, yeah. No, it's a really, really interesting point. And hopefully it's going to open up the way for more research to look into that. But you're right, it's a really interesting observation because definitely you've seen the same, particularly people that report a history of motion sickness as a child. And then it's like, I used to get most as a child. Is that does that explain why I'm now dizzy now? Because like we often talk about a PD, the the context of the time when the acute episode of dizziness starts, like you say, from ear infection, that there may be for a, a large amount of them that there's like ongoing stress at that period of time that may be involved in making it become more chronic. But why is it that you know plenty of people would become dizzy over the COVID pandemic, for example? But why is it that? Some mm. people attribute the persisting dizziness to the stress ongoing at the time, whereas others who are also stressed at the time and got dizzy also recovered from it. Could it be that there's another predisposition to it in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really highlighting that the triple BD in particular, but chronic dizziness it is complex. It's, it's multifactorial. There's loads of bits to it. There is no, you know, magic pill. You know, people often wanting that one medication that resolve it. That there isn't one. You know, no. they want that one one exercise. There isn't one. It has to be this like tailored program. How how is that person dealing with it? What's involved? You know, what are their signs and symptoms? What are they finding hard? What do they find easy? And then it's tailoring that system to them, that uh, um, uh, program to them to make sure it's it's the right one. So. We do this all the time, don't we, Ben? Someone will do an exercise, and if they say it's easy, we're like, make it harder. And if they're like, and if they say it was horrible, then we we either make it easier or we take it out completely. There's no no kind of, um, you know, some VOR times one where you're looking at the target turning your head is like a hallmark of Mr. Blue Rehab. Some mm. people hate it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're probably in the minority, but some people absolutely hate that. There are clinicians out there would say well you just keep doing it go away and do it for six months until you get better yeah that probably is not the right way for that person you probably want to say okay if, if it's really awful we find a, a better way to do that for you and maybe maybe you can come back to it later yeah it really is about tailoring it to them yeah and the map people that have come on and, and kind of you've probably seen the same thing where it's like they're like well i've done vestibular rehab before what's so different about yours and actually a lot of the times they always have many different reasons why but but a lot of it, it's like, well, I, I was given, like you say, I was given the VOR times one to do, or they might have seen it on YouTube. And it's like, well, how are you doing it? It's like, like this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you've been chronically dizzy and you go and do that, you, you're not going to want to do that. That's just, mm -hmm. that's, that's going to trigger things off. And actually starting, well, in that instance, obviously, starting a bit more gentle and building things back up is the simple, but <laughs> say magic ingredient, obviously, within everything else, but it's a simple change to make. Yeah, I've, I, I, we we both had patients who have said their first exercise. Think, bearing in mind that sensory sensitivity we just discussed of, uh, of of all that, I've had people who said their first exercise was walking up and down the stairs with their eyes closed. I mean, can you imagine if you're if you're already really scared and anxious, oh, and the first exercise is the stairs are one of the most dangerous places in the house, right? Yeah, so you've got the stairs and the kitchen and the bathroom. Those are like the dangerous places. Bathroom because it's wet and slippy, so that's a, a nasty one. Stairs because mm -hmm. they're stairs. Um, interesting they used to record data on the number of falls in the house on on rooms and uh, for some reason one of the governments decided they weren't interested anymore so we used to have actual data on on how many falls in the house were related to staircases and i think i'm um, one of my gut instincts is they stopped it because if 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 we have a bunch of data that says that stairs are the reason people are falling over yeah. what's the alternative it kind of pushes <laughs> the conversation that says right health and safety now needs to make those stairs safer well yeah. oh my god that's a huge thing to do across the house, across the uh, country <laughs> But yeah, so if you're if you know you're someone who is already a bit more sensory sensitive, the question is, what do we do? We want to try and give yourself a stable foundation, so your brain is using what you see and comparing that to what you feel from your ears and body. If you can't integrate your systems very well or they're uncalibrated, you'll feel more stressed, which makes you more sensory sensitive. So what we, what we need to do is get your brain to recalibrate what you see, so that it can recalibrate. Sorry, compare what you see to what you feel. 
And as you have that strong foundation, you will become less sensory sensitive. I was thinking about this with walking, you know, doing, um, I was walking around the house and thinking, right, I'm going to putting myself in a, in a position of someone who's very visually dominant. I'm going to really just check as I go from room to room, just purely rely on vision. And actually it's really disorientating as you twist and turn all the time. And I thought, actually, when you're walking, what, what normally happens is you go into this default mode. So you, as you walk, you, your brain kind of goes into this automatic function where you're just walking along and then you can start to almost daydream, right? You can start thinking, oh, this evening we'll have sausages for dinner. And then uh, I want to have Ben's getting on. Oh, and, and your brain can just kind of ruminate on these things. So actually walking should be a fairly almost subconscious process. Right. But when you're dizzy, you're so sensory sensitive that every step is, where's my right foot? Where's my left foot? Where's the door? Or oh, I'm going to miss it. Or oh, my your husband's about to bump into me. Or oh, who's that stranger? So what we want is as that foundation gets stronger, you should be able to start to relax and movement becomes more automatic again. So again, when we're doing exercises, the kind of first six weeks of our course is all about that stability. And the second half of the course is more about orientation so that you can start to get into that. We move away from exercises, we move into activities and we want those activities to be almost thoughtless, that you just do them without having to think through. Because then the more focused you are, it's a bit like if I said to you, Ben, oh, I want you to start thinking about ants crawling on your skin. Pretty soon you're going to start feeling ants crawling on your skin. Straight away. And so it's the same with, with dizziness, that the more you think about it, the easier it is to feel it. So, mm -hmm. um, and then the other part is that, is that cognitive behavioral therapy, that relaxation, mindfulness, and just trying to shift your attention away from, um, away from these sensations. So it's easy as it is to say that, but I appreciate it mm. takes time to practice. And even like I say, you lose, even if someone can't shift it away from it, it's being able to just see it for what it is and not attach some kind of judgment or emotion or, or, or negative connotation to it. Yeah. Again, exactly. Easy to done. <laughs> I, I developed really severe tinnitus when I was 22, uh, just from being a usual student, you know, just going to normal, you know, student bar nights and stuff like that. And one day I left a club um, and my ears were screaming. And then that continued for a week. And bit literally the next six months over every conversation, all I hear is this scream tinnitus. And I really learned the more I seek help and the more I focus on it and, and talk about it, the more devastating it is, the more I hear it. And then there came this breaking point where I was like, oh, I'm done. Like, just can't be bothered anymore. Just get on with it. And the more I started just to try to, you know, frankly, ignore it, the better and better it is. So now I can't hear it. It's still there. Now I've said the word tinnitus, I can hear it. <laughs> um, um, and now I actually use it as like a biofeedback thing. So if I'm been working too much, sleeping too little, or, or I'm getting sick, I'll hear that tinnitus. I'm like, oh, I've become more sensitive to it. Okay, probably time to take take a break. And so I encourage people with dizziness to do that too. If you know it's actually doing pretty well and then that dizziness starts to get worse, just take a step back and, and view it. Don't get scared about it. View it and say, actually, you know what? I, I, have, I was on the computer a lot yesterday. I haven't been exercising. I didn't go for a walk. You know, actually, actually my husband's, well, my, my wife's got a, got a cold. Maybe I'm fighting something. Just, just rationalize it and see it. It's not necessarily that the dizziness is worse. It's maybe the sensory sensitivity has just peaked up a little bit and look at what you can do to try and calm that stress system down again. Mm, yeah, that's a great point. Great, Ben. So we're going to keep discussing these, these research papers on all forms of dizziness. Um, thanks so much for taking time to talk to me today, Ben. My pleasure.